All right. Hello, everyone. Hope you're doing well. Well, that was something, an incredible 24-hour period. It was around this time yesterday afternoon that I was getting word on social media that Prigozhin was making extremely bold statements. And, you know, one could be forgiven for just thinking that it was a bunch of noise. Uh, You see this fairly often, but it wasn't noise, or was it? (laughs) Uh, So late last night, we started to get word that the Wagner military group was marching for justice, in their words. They never referred to it as a coup. And many of the statements from Pergosian were fairly ambiguous. They could be read in both ways. I got a vibe of, if only the Pope knew what the evil bishops were up to from some of the statements. Uh, And I also got the vibe of, we are taking this to the limit and we are going to prosecute the war in a new ferocious fashion. Um, I I, I think that's kind of the nature of some leaders like Prigozhin or, or leaders in general. Famously, de Gaulle said, I understand you, uh, in which he was able to speak to both sides of uh, an incipient civil war, I guess you could say, in France. And so I think that Prigozhin was playing both sides in this way. Well, I was up very late last night because I couldn't get off Twitter. I'm, I'm actually happy that I don't have a social media addiction in the way that I uh, maybe did at some point or in the, in the, you know, it's forgivable in this day and age, but I just couldn't get off Twitter last night because there was just news flowing in. Um, so the Wagner group effectively took Rostov. I mean, I don't know what, how else you would describe a situation in which you walk in with armored vehicles and enter the head of the military operations there and then begin speaking to a general. That was extremely bold and interesting. And then they started heading north. So Rostov is is, um, on Dom, I believe. So it's uh, near the Azov Sea. And uh, it is a, let's say an eight or 10 hour drive um, up to Moscow, probably take longer than that in a tank. Never done it that way. But then I wake up this morning and apparently it all was a bit fake, though not exactly. Uh, Putin did issue a televised address to all networks in which he also made bold statements. And he brought his country back to 1917 and the Civil War and um, one of some of the white generals, uh, white in, in, in the sense of the uh, Russian Civil War, white versus red, uh, who basically attacked the provisional government. So this was post-abdication by the czar and pre-Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, which the Soviets signed with Imperial Germany and which ceded... I guess, a huge amount of territory. I mean, much of what is Ukraine and above that to Germany. Um, And Putin was evoking this notion of, you know, we were about to win and then we were stabbed in the back. It's a kind of Dachstoss, you know, type uh, argument, and which is pretty dubious. Uh, The Russia, Russia was definitely not faring well at all in that war. And they were in effect defeated by Germany, which is something that is often forgotten. The Treaty of Brest-Litovsk signed with the Soviets in the Imperial Germany was canceled by the fact that Germany lost in the West and they had their own stab in the back myth, of course. Um, And uh, the Soviet Union ultimately didn't need to cede all of that territory. But Putin does, you know, I think you could say Putin is this sphinx. He's this hollow man in a way. He is empty. He has no vision. He is corrupt, but maybe not so corrupt to be gaudy about it. 
Uh, what is his ideology? Is it left or right or center? I think a lot of that doesn't even make sense when you're dealing with Putin. He wants a depoliticized society, a demobilized society. Basically, he is one of those autocrats that wants the public to just look the other way, mind their own business, and outsource all decisions to him. And it's not fascism, it's not communism, but it might share some elective affinities with both. It's a curious type of order that he has created. Um, so anyway, uh, he, but, but I would say this about Putin. He does have an historical consciousness. Now, he might be wrong about a lot of these things and delusional, in fact, but he does have a consciousness of these things and he justifies his actions on the basis of historical continuity. And that is something that's very important about Putin. Um, a six months or a year, excuse me, six months or a year before the invasion of Ukraine, he issued a, an historical essay, <laughs> something you might turn into an undergraduate seminar on the unity of the Ukrainian and Russian people. And, you know, I, I think that was maybe the first step in mobilization for an invasion. It was a historical continuity justification for what he was about to do. Uh, so anyway, Wagner and Prigozhin seem to have backed down and we, we seem to have reached this just bizarre situation. Um, at least my mentality is that when you cast the die or cross the Rubicon, as the cliches go, you are in it to win it. And if you don't win, you are going to die. Um, even if we look at the Declaration of Independence, the founding fathers, Jefferson and company, they were at least aware of the fact that if they didn't win this gambit against uh, Britain and King George, that they were probably going to have their lands confiscated and they might very well be hanged. And they said, let's do this. <laughs> let's go. And I, I, so the fact that this is the outcome does strike me as incredible, but maybe it shouldn't strike me as incredible. And I'll, I'll get, that, get to that in a little bit. So apparently, reportedly, Prigozhin has negotiated with Belarus's Lukashenko. He has reportedly traveled to Belarus, so he's kind of fled and basically, I, I think a lot of the Wagner armed forces are going to return to the front. I mean, this strikes me as uh, incredible or bizarre. Was all of this just a negotiation plan? I think that might very well be true. Uh, Wagner in Prigozhin has already made bold statements against the government. Uh, we remember those videos of Prigozhin standing before a field of dead corpse, dead bodies and saying how we're not getting enough supplies and ammunition. And the other thing about it is the Prigozhin might be getting a little too big for his britches. That is, he is this flamboyant, highly emotional, um, despite the fact that he was a former restaurateur, incredibly badass figure. And might that be seen as a kind of threat to the government? Putin is clearly much more comfortable dealing with boring, gray, bureaucratic, former KGB operative men who are just extremely mediocre, but rather cagey and sophisticated in the, in, in the sense of being able to, you know, know which lever to pull and string to pull and, button to push and all that kind of stuff. So do you want this wild man uh, as a, an internet celebrity of sorts? And I think in the beginning, he was an internet celebrity among the pro-Russian shills. And it was, you know, the, the hero Bakhmut and Wagner is totally badass and all this kind of stuff. Uh, maybe for a very brief moment, he became a bit of a hero 
to uh, the pro-NATO or pro-American or you pro-European side as the man who's creating all of this chaos in Russia and is going to help Ukraine win the war. Um, you know, I don't know how to think about this. We, you know, we have this sense of honor in which if you're going to do a coup, you've got to complete it. This is maybe my fundamental problem or criticism of J6 and all of these people who want to apologize for J6. So J6 was a coup on some level. Now, it, it had very little chance of succeeding. It was buffoonish. It was aborted. It was a, 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 a disaster. But it was an attempt to halt government. And it clearly was an attempt to keep Trump in power. In fact, many of those people wandering around through the halls of the Capitol were saying things like, you know, Trump is going to be in, in here for another four years. We've won. This is a revolution. All this kind of stuff. Uh, Nick Fuentes, while holding a bullhorn within earshot of people invading the Capitol, was yelling, we are not leaving here until Trump is installed for another four years. So, again, it was a kind of limited coup. It wasn't a, in t exactly a change in government, but it was something. And the response to the coup has been this weird, contradictory uh, uh, um, uh, uh, packing in of like denial, conspiracy theory, and justification. So you'll get from someone like Tucker Carlson or Darren Beatty or all of the people who follow them, you'll get this combination of why was Ashley Babbitt shot? We might never know why she, why she was brutally executed by a government thug. And then you'll also get Americans were outraged and they wanted to make sure that this election went the right way. And there was a tremendous amount of fraud uh, that we are refusing to investigate and all this. So they're, they're justifying what's happening. And they'll say, this was a great outpouring. This was an uprising of the American public, and blah, blah, blah. So they'll justify it. And they'll like, also, it was a Fed surrection. The FBI, the FBI was surely involved in some way. Uh, at the very least, they, they clearly had covert people, you know, around or assets or whatever. I'll, I'll grant them that. But, you know, they go further. You know, the FBI created this, you know, um, you know, Epps whispered into someone's ear and launched this uh, debilitating action that has harmed Trump or wh whatever the hell they argue. And so in a way, they don't want to take ownership of it. And so they just, they get in this place where they have no honor. You know, I mean, Sulla or Caesar had more honor than these guys. If you, you can do a coup, but if you lose, you've got to face the consequences. They just won't. And so they, they, they wrap themselves up into this ball of contradictions. Of it was a conspiracy. It was great. It was nothing. We were just tourists, whatever. Denial. Uh, so they, they, it's, it's pathological, their response to it. It's not serious. Now, I don't think that's what's going on with Wagner. I was simply drawing an analogy to compare and contrast. Um, I, I think the most likely situation of Prigozhin and Wagner is this, that Prigozhin understandably thought that he might be killed. Even if it's not true that the Russian military bombed Wagner units, and, you know, uh, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Maybe that was staged. Maybe that was a misunderstanding. Maybe it was friendly fire attack. I, I don't know. But I think he has a point in the sense that was the Wagner group getting too big for their britches? And might the Kremlin, which, you know, the, the nail that sticks out gets hammered down, might they have wanted to eliminate Prigozhin? or send him into a battle that he couldn't win. I mean, all of those are, I think, fairly reasonable suggestions. And so Prigozhin wanted to negotiate. And what's the best way to negotiate but to be a madman and threaten to overthrow the government, and then they'll give you something that you want. So I think the, the most likely you know, scenario that we're looking at is that this real Russia really is a mafia state 
none of this is serious. None of these people have any honor whatsoever. None of these people have any vision whatsoever. They're just covering their ass and trying to get away with whatever they can. So anyway, that is my take on the matter, but I would love to hear what you have to say. Um, so yeah, good. We've got about 120 or so in. Uh, if you'd like to speak, just make a request and we can talk. All right, not everyone at once. <laughs> okay, I guess I can say more um, to keep the conversation going. Uh, what are some other, uh, w one thing that is funny, okay, there we got a request. One thing that is funny about all of this is the, uh, the Russian shill reaction where they're just kind of rationalizing and like, you know, modifying their take as the seconds go by. And now obviously everyone does that to some degree. You, you should react to new data or the experience or et cetera, but it's, it's not really defensible on their part in the sense of like, it's just about saying Russia's good. The West is going to die and we're winning guys. And they just, you know, are struggling to come up with a new take. So it's like, this isn't real, or this is a, uh, this is a trap for Shogu laid by Putin. I think Russians with an attitude and Jackson Hinkle were on that. So or they at least suggested it. And it was like, oh, so uh, Prigozhin is going to launch this, quote, coup, and then they're going to get rid of Shogu, and then he's going to be in charge, and Putin's behind this. Well, that is negated by the fact that Putin gave this very bold speech calling Wagner leadership, at least traitors, and claiming that this is a massive crisis. Uh, I don't think he would do that if he were in on it. And certainly, if Putin wants to get rid of Sho Shoigu, then he can just do it. Uh, he can claim, you know, he can just fire him or he could put a dead prostitute in the trunk of his car and arrest him or something. He doesn't need to launch a coup, which is just obviously demoralizing. I, I don't know how anyone can suggest, like Ian Michael Chong or whatever, whoever, whatever his name is, suggested this is good for Russia and they're all united. No, this is a, it, it, it's a debacle. And whether it will lead to the end of the Russian war effort remains to be seen, but there is no possible way you can spit this as good. You look chaotic, you look fractured. Um, and I think the, the main thing that I would say about Putin's relationship with the Russian people is that he wants them depoliticized. De he wants them just trusting the plan, basically, putting their faith in Putin and not having a strong opinion about the matter either way, having a kind of vague nationalism at most, which pretty much everyone has. And uh, the fact that they were, you know, hearing rumors of a coup and a change in government and chaos and a bloody civil war, that is not good for Putin. And he looks very weak at this point. So anyway, these are just some thoughts. Uh, what do you guys have to say? I'll go to Lab Rat first and then Eurogenset. Yeah, I think this whole thing is like very interesting because, uh, I mean, as you said, I mean, if you're going to launch a coup attempt like this, I don't understand why you just finish it because, uh, and what I think is very interesting is that he actually had like uh, there was like no opposition from uh, this like coup attempt from what I can see. And it was just, uh, um, uh, I mean, because who is really uh, willing to like die for Putin at this point? Because all the people who would like normally support him, who would might be like sort of vaguely nationalist, uh, like Russian soldiers, they're like sick of, uh, uh, of the lack of progression at front of in Ukraine, so they are not willing to like die to protect Putin, and you don't really have any, and it doesn't have like any ideological committed people either. Like, for instance, like Erdogan when he was in, in his coup attempt, he had like Islamists who go who went out in the street just f during the coup attempt and like 
protest, who were organized from the mosques and like uh, protested for him. You didn't see anything uh, equivalent to that in like uh, the uh, Orthodox Church or any other institution where there were people who felt like we have to stop this. So I do think it's like very interesting that was sort of like aborted halfway through. It was yeah. Uh, Putin completed. has no ideology, and I I think you could outside of historical continuation i think that is his one ideological uh principle and and he probably will never relent on that one now it it was interesting because i i did a space last night because you know stuff is happening uh fast and furious at the point but xbox live pointed out this and i think anatoly carlin who, who is a russian nationalist but is a realist person so i i think he actually is valuable Um, But anyway, he was saying that, yes, the Wagner group are these maniacs. It was founded by someone who seems to be a kind of Nazi enthusiast. And Prigozhin is this, you know, former hot dog salesman, come restaurateur, come oligarch, come leader of a paramilitary organization. I mean, a remarkable man. (laughs) You know, if you say... (laughs) There's anything that's correct, you know, true about him. He is a remarkable man, uh, but they seem to have a kind of hint of an ideology in the Wagner group, and it's similar to Putin's, but more outlandish and badass. And and so I don't think. I, yeah. I mean, maybe Prigozhin was going to end the war in Ukraine. I mean, he said it's based on lies and all this kind of stuff. Maybe, but I think it's more likely that he represents a force that would prosecute the war even more vehemently and violently. And there's a kind of hint of this Russian imperial ideology within Wagner. And, you know, again, most of their fighting men are convicts or loons or just merely mercenaries, etc. But I do think that there's a hint of a kind of badass imperialism that is there. And maybe that is something that could be called upon in a time of crisis. You know, it's like these are the Russia is failing. So let's call out the just diehard, hardline maniacs. Uh, And I I, I think that's actually a a fair suggestion. Yeah, and it's very interesting because uh, Wagner is obviously not part of the traditional like structure of the uh, military. And And I do think it was kind of interesting because... I saw yesterday, I forgot exactly how it was formulated, but even uh, Prigozhin is sort of like attacking the military as almost like an illegitimate institution where he said like, oh, we, we are like sending these children to their death in Ukraine. And for people who don't know, this has been like a long liberal critique of like Russian military that uh, they sort of like have uh, abuse of conscripts or whatever. Um, uh, I forgot her name, but the girl who was shot in circa 2005 uh, who was this liberal Russian journalist and was uh, murdered quite brutally in an elevator. And she wrote about it in her books who called, I think it was called Putin's Russia, where she, uh, I think it was even more than one chapter where she talks about the, the brutal, um, how brutally, uh, like the abuse of like Russian conscripts and whatever. Yeah, no doubt. So I do think it's very interesting. Yeah. So I do think it's very interesting how um, you have this almost like, yeah, uh, mercenary force which is more legitimate than uh, like the Russian military itself and it does also say how like dysfunctional the Russian state is where you don't really have any I mean it's much more like dysfunctional than the Soviet or the imperial Russian state well, yeah, where they could at least like no, fought the war like, yeah. there's no actual ideology uh, you know I, I, again outside of historical continuance it is a mafia state and I'm sorry to sound like a liberal or neocon but sometimes they're right you know, like it's not real. And all of these people in the West f- throwing their like Christianity onto it or like trad wife fantasy or whatever, it's just ridiculous at the end of the day. And I mean, as, as Boris um, was, was saying in, in the last space, like they're, they're almost moving towards functionally speaking communism in terms of state ownership of the economy. Now, there's no ideology. And so whatever you want to say about the Bolsheviks, they obviously had an extreme ideology. And you can kind of gain legitimacy from the fact that you are, you know, part of a force of history or something. 
with someone like Brezhnev, you you have to kind of be a protector of like the good parts of communism. You know, you know, it's like, well, we haven't reached full socialism yet, but we're close and we need to be realist about the matter. I, I think he said somewhere where there's there was no flight of fancy in Bolshevism. It was a realistic understanding of historical development, et cetera. And we're going to get there soon. And then Gorbachev was like a true believing communist, the irony of Gorbachev, a reformer and someone who wanted, genuinely wanted out to, to reach out to the West, but, but also did it in good faith and was a communist leader in good faith. And um, all of those things are sources of legitimacy. Putin has thrown away all of that. And it's just like, you know, for, you know, former KGB operatives, you know, running the show, picking out oligarchs, assassinating people they don't like, and just maintaining this extraction economy of pulling minerals and gases out of the ground and selling them. And it's just pathetic. And to even pretend that this is like some alternative to, you know, the American way of life or globo homo or however way the right wing wants to suggest it is just ridiculous. Like it's a mafia state. Like Ann Applebaum is correct. <laughs> like sometimes they're right. The liberals and neocons. And I mean, it's a I joke. I, I do think it's very fascinating that none of these people who uh, like, I think I tweeted this that none of the like ideological Putinists are actually Russians because right. <laughs> um, like all of them live in the West and none of them. And obviously, it is like possible to move to Russia if you really want to, even as a Westerner with like the uh, like barriers in like immigration and whatever. Um, uh, so. I mean, it's it's like very fascinating that there's like no one in actual Russia who's like an ideological Putin shield who would say like, oh, Putin is like fighting against Satan, and I'm willing to like die for him and like kill, uh, like demonstrate against uh, Wagner troops in Moscow. Uh, I mean, no one has like that even exists. I do think that was an like, interesting slogan during the 2000s, during one, I think it was 2008 during that election campaign, um, where. Were uh, sort of like Putin supporters. He had this uh, slogan where it was, uh, um, "If not Putin, who?" <laughs> and uh, I do think that's kind of kind of, in, kind of interesting. That uh, it's not really like pro Putin. It's just like they have like eliminated everyone else, which is sort of like a realistic pretend, a realistic contender. Yeah. So it's just like, well, yeah. And uh, you you see this a lot when you read about uh, like from Russia that even people who don't really. I do think this works in peacetime. We have a lot of people who are like, well, I don't like Putin, but whatever. I mean, uh, I have to pay like bribes. Right, that police, works but, in uh, peacetime, but uh, yeah. not now. But, yeah. Like, it, it starts to, it, 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 that kind of thing doesn't work anymore because there are clearly alternatives to Putin. I mean, as, you know, th this coup was aborted and so on, but clearly th it, it was kind of, sort of possible. I mean, maybe, I mean, that he could have taken this Ab to the Ab Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I do think it's very interesting because as I said, like who, people say that, oh, this was just a silly attempt from this like uh, restaurant here, uh, former restaurant here, who are uh, sort of like uh, extravagant and uh, eccentric and whatever. But I do think like who realistically at the Red Square would like uh, shoot, uh, like confront and uh, die for Putin. I mean, none of those people even exist. I mean, like Anatole Korn said that the only one realistically would be like the Chechens. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and I'm not even sure they're all in Moscow now. So, yeah. but like no one else would like take it besides personal bodyguards. And they are obviously not equipped to handle uh, like uh, armed, uh, an armed confrontation with a mercenary group. So, and there's like another thing as well where I wonder if this like coup attempt has failed. I mean, I wonder, like, uh, uh, like it, it looks like it's going to be a complete disaster for Russia now because uh, the regime in power now is not open for negotiation, and at the same time they don't really want to persecute, um, prosecute the war like realistically and, and mobilize the economy and uh, no, the military no, in a way that to, makes them win. Not, this this is an important thing, and I, I probably need to move on to some other speakers. But you you brought up some very good points as usual, uh, me But like this is the issue: is that yeah. Russia or the, the Kremlin will do some like military parades and they'll they'll do those big festivals where 
it's like kind of like a rock concert and Putin will come out and, or literally a rock concert in the sense that they'll, they'll perform some songs, Putin will come out and get the crowd roaring and all that kind of stuff. But that's not really mo mobilization. Like Putin is not going to go out there and say, this is total war. We're, we're, I'm demanding blood, sweat, and tears. We will fight to the death for this. He is not going to do that. Things that you did see in the 20th century and, and in other times as well. He's not going to do that. So he can't mobilize the population because that's the deal that he struck. The deal that he struck is depoliticization of the Russian people and, and, and cracking down on dissidents, both left and right. Navalny, you know, neo-fascist in Russia, but also like liberal reformist and whatever. So he can't mobilize the public. Um, and so I don't know kind of what he's going to do, because at some point, it, like, granted, the counteroffensive is not get, making major territorial gains. And there's some people suggesting, you know, it's, it's um, falling below expectations and so on. All of that might be true, but like, that's also kind of true for Russia. I mean, this is a big deal. This isn't the Chechen war in which the West was not paying attention or, or even kind of vaguely supporting it. I mean, Putin visited George W. Bush and they were like, oh, let's fight terrorism together and all this after 9-11. Um, this is a global conflict in which the West, particularly the United States, is pouring billions into this. And there is a specter of a, you know, actual mano a mano conflict with NATO. So you've got to mobilize your population, but he can't do that due to the nature of his rule. So I just don't see this as working out, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, I, I, and now it's like, oh yeah, well maybe a warlord could just like take over, you know, whatever, <laughs> you know, like that's, a, that's a, now a possibility. Whereas I think <laughs> like four or five years ago, Putin had kind of worn down the public of like, there is no other. There is no alternative to me, and you're going to have to settle for me. And I think that. Can I jump in on that point? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. So I was saying to Bodimu earlier, and something that seems no one seems to be commenting on it. It looks so bad that uh, Lukashenko was the one to really tie this back together and to and to calm things down. Um, it, on on twofold, really on on two on two different levels. One that that it shows that Putin isn't even controlling enough to, to really, uh, you know, negotiate or, or, or uh, calm down a coup in his own country. Uh, they need, they need a third party, right, to, for him to do that. Uh, and then second of all, it also <laughs> elevates the station of Prigozhin to such a high level that, that he, I know it's Lukashenko and, you know, he, he's so tied up with Russia, but he, he, he himself, you know, his presence and person de demands a head of state of another country to be negotiated with. I mean, that's, you know, that's, that looks bad. Yeah. You know, it looks very, very, very bad. Um, well, the, the and no one's really commented on that. Prigozhin, so I just thought, like, what are your thoughts about Lukashenko in, in this whole well, thing? Yeah, and, the yeah. fact that Prigozhin is not dead, I think, looks bad for Putin. You know? Yeah. I mean, like, you can't yeah. say these things. You, you can't directly confront the government you you know obviously in america free speech and all that kind of stuff you know but you can't actually delegitimize the government or confront them without facing death and i mean that's actually a really good point because imagine if you had like a billionaire in america who who like uh, had a mercenary, like uh, a mercenary group or like part of the military, and they occupy like San Diego for a day right. or something. I mean that that person would be like uh, put on trial immediately. Yeah, I did, and on that, because I was saying this to Bodum as well earlier on, is that like he, I, I can't remember the exact number, but I think Putin was he hadn't said anything last night for about five hours after it started, and I mean I was saying to Bodum, could you imagine if uh, I don't know, uh, America, an American army coup had, had successfully taken over a, a city in the Midwest or something, and um, Biden hadn't spoke for like six hours, how bad that would look, you know what I mean, if there, if there were like army tanks on, you know, uh, on, on, on soil, you know, sort of giving orders to, to civilians, 
and and the head of state being totally incommunicado. Right. That would look awful, you know, like that, you know, and and but that's literally what happened in Russia, and no one draws these contrasts. And you know, the uh, there, there, there's you know. there's also like an important point I want to say that I wonder a bit about. This is a bit like a little cliche, but I wonder a bit about like. Uh, uh, Putin's uh, mental state because, uh, like, sometimes I think I have his like seen as or have a stroke or something. Because I saw like a few weeks ago before this happened, um, where he was like completely, he was at a meeting with some military leaders and the press, and he was completely uninterested in what was happening in Ukraine at the front and started talking about trannies and whatever. It was like, and you just think, like, uh, like this is not really a serious person. And you started to, I always get like the same impression that. The, like when Trump went up on stage and started talking 15 minutes about how they had like uh, uh, about washing machines and how they had like uh, oh well, now you get we have like removed regulations on washing machines so now evil regulations the Democrats have put in place so now you can have like great shower heads and great washing right. machines now and I'm just thinking like what the hell is wrong with you when you just talk about trans but you have like a literal war I mean, like, uh, this is what's so what fucked up with Putin. Like, he would rather, uh, like, uh, if, if there's, like, ethnic cleansing of, like, Russians in Donbass or Crimea, he doesn't really care on some level. All he can, if he can, like, his priority is, like, banning sodomy or whatever. It's so bizarre. Yeah. Granted, if I were a military leader involved in a coup, I might just take over San Diego. And then just, and then tell the government, <laughs> hey, man, can I just keep San Diego? Like, I want, you know. It would be, you know, deal, right? <laughs> it's not a big city. Fair point. <laughs> <laughs> Very sunny as well. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, right. Uh, you're, um, you're uh, how do you pronounce this? Yeah, sorry. Um, oh. Yeah, a couple of anecdotes. That, <laughs> hey, a couple of anecdotes to just uh, buttress some of the points being made. So uh, at one point, Dmitry Peskov, the, you know, the presidential spokesperson, uh, he said something, you know, before things got really bad, he said something about, oh, oh uh, Putin is sleeping soundly. You know, basically, like, everything is fine. So there's almost this like they they curate this image of Putin that you know of of total calm and I think it's the the, the passivity uh, is actually excessive yeah. and by trying to have him be this you know he's behind closed doors he's he doesn't say things very often um, it's like yeah when there's a coup happening you should probably be on TV not be sleeping soundly um, and just some other kind of remarkable. Uh, things that I saw were, you know, just the the Wagner uh, vehicles rolling by National Guard troops. And, you know, there was like this half-hearted, uh, you know, bus, but, you know, they just put some buses on the road, hoping that would stop these, you know, these these armored vehicles. And of course it didn't. And then the, the guardsmen were just kind of watching them go by and kind of just buttressing the point about no one really wants to uh, put their lives on the on the line for that. And, and one of the uh, the governors of one of the re regions that the, the convoy had to pass through, he, he released this remarkable statement where he just said, yes, you know, Wagner, Wagner vehicles, they're, you know, heading through our territory. He, he didn't denounce it at all. I mean, obviously he can't do anything just as a governor, but he didn't denounce it at all. He just said, um, you know, he just basically said that all the civilian stuff is fine. You know, nothing, the hospitals are running, that kind of thing. But it was just totally, you know, he was basically right on the fence. He was not, willing to say anything to, to denounce the um the convoy so i think there's just a lot of you know people were just total fence sitting and were not willing to get involved at all which just demonstrates kind of the, the weakness and, and also just the uh the reaction of the people in uh, rostov there were a couple of boomers kind of yelling at the wagner people but there were also younger people bringing food and drinks to the wagner uh troops and chatting with them very very friendly taking selfies in front of the tanks yeah. so um, I, I had heard as recently as yesterday some kind of pro-Russian uh, American acquaintance saying, oh, Putin has 80 to 90 percent popularity. But it's like, <laughs> clearly, clearly, you know, the people in Rostov uh, were not horrified by these events and they were curious and definitely not going to do what they did in Turkey, like uh, Bartimu mentioned, where they were, you know, standing in front of tanks to stop the coup. Definitely nothing like that was happening. Yeah, so, well, because it's a depoliticized society. And, and, and I think that's what it, it's difficult for a lot of Americans to understand because we live in a hyper politicized society. And so, like, if a president had, in, in this day and age, if a president had 90% approval rating, then he would, 
in effect, be this kind of fascist leader that's, you know, mobilizing the public and they, they, they're at his beck and call. But, you know, we live in this polarized and politicized society where, you know, half of the country or a third of the country hates literally everything that Biden does. And the other third uh, loves everything that Biden does. And the other third is kind of indifferent or, or so on. In, in Russia, it's, it's like 75 percent of the population doesn't really care and maybe has some vague uh, nationalist sentiments, but they're not willing to lift a finger for them. Um, I, I mean, I do think that's very interesting because, I mean, people all, often call like Peter Hitchens a Russia shill, and it's sort of somewhat yeah. true. But, uh, at the, but he wrote articles in uh, like 1999 or 2000, like the first Putin election, which, um, and, and he said that even then people were like, uh, um, like, uh, or I forgot about 2000, 2004, but, and, but anyway, the people even back then said that, yeah, I have to pay bribes to like, uh, in like to public officials and whatever. And it's not a great country, but, uh, but at least, uh, like there's not hyperinflation like under Yeltsin or under Gorbachev and there's like food at the grocery store. So we're sort of like happy that, uh, there's like some sort of stability and it's not complete chaos. And as you said earlier, you can sort of, uh, live through that uh, like status quo corruption in peacetime but when it becomes war and like when the legitimacy of uh, like your entire state is a question you cannot really do with uh, like go along with uh, um, you have to do better than just that and just uh, the sort of like uh, vague uh, vague approval I mean you have to like mobilize people I mean it's so demoralizing the whole thing yeah. uh, okay Thrax, would you like to speak? The reason why there was no repercussion for that is because nobody was given orders to repercute. And Wagner did never declare a coup against Putin. Putin. That's why they never met any hostilities between the civilians. Oh, so. so and also, you're wrong so that Putin, that Putin doesn't really have a code of personality. confused about a paramilitary group uh, driving tanks into a city. Like that, that was all part of the plan? No, I think it's all schizophrenia. Well, what's but the... they never declared against Putin and he never declared any repercussion. Yes, they him. did. He didn't they... declare well, the shortage. Wait, 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 wait. They, they claimed that he, did they he did not declare anyone to shoot at them. He didn't declare any. I, I really enjoy listening to you people. They threatened to prosecute him for 20 years for an armed mutiny. Putin didn't say that. Oh, Putin didn't say that. Just his government did. Sorry, 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 Richard. One second, but didn't didn't uh, Russian choppers fire on on Wagner? I saw some images. Uh, sending one five four was it four? I think four an airplane. I think that's unserious. And who even sent them? I didn't even see any official channels talk about. Okay, so 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 just random high high tech. <laughs> military aircraft that, that don't belong to the Russian state at that particular point in time are firing on Wagner. Is that, is that, your, is that your hypothesis? It, it was one, then another, then another, and they got was, shut out pretty quickly. And there wasn't any the official statement. Was Putin's address there wasn't the, any official statement. Was Putin's address to the public a hologram? I mean, should we maybe think about that? Was Putin in the convoy <laughs> with Prigozhin? And a holographic image was actually on television. I mean, that that might be true, man. I mean, I do think this is very interesting that sort of address he made because uh, uh, there's like a red thread throughout this whole thing where he's more concerned about the preservation of his uh, regime than he is about uh, success uh, in Ukraine. Uh, because as I said, he haven't like when there's like failure in that front in Ukraine, he sort of start talking about uh, like. Uh, Trannies and whatever, and sort of like stupid country war stuff. But then when there's like uh, uh, Wagner troops marching against Moscow, then he puts out the video where he talks about mutiny and about, oh, this is an attack on our state and we need to uh, like uh, be together as Russians when there's like foreign threat. And then it's suddenly it's all seriously serious. So it's just, I mean, this is like, I mean, it does remind me almost a bit like Trump on some level. Everything's just fundamentally unserious. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. <sighs> Yeah, no, uh, uh, a 
a, a fleet of Russian helicopters fired on a uh, Wagner military convoy near, and I'm sorry if I'm butchering this, but Vor- Voronezh, Voronezh in Russia. Yeah, I saw these images, and I, I you know, again, fog of war. Are, it, are those images legit, or is that, you know? But yes, and, and also, I also noticed that Prigozhin said that we haven't spilled a drop of blood of our soldiers, which <laughs> seems to avoid the question of whether they killed Russian soldiers. I, I, I don't know. This whole thing is just a murky mess. Well, that's crazy as well, because last night, last night, Wagner claimed to have shot down a Russian helicopter. So what do they, what do they mean by that? Right. Like, what's going on? <laughs> you know. Well... I think, in a sense, he might have been saying that no Wagner troops died, which I don't think there's any evidence of that. Yeah, yeah th- that's what I, I think. Saying. Some of their vehicles. Yeah. But go on. Yeah, some of their ve- some of their vehicles, I think, might have gotten hit by the helicopters, but um, maybe maybe there are no casualties. Uh, one other point is that um, kind of about the lack of ideology is that. Um, so I, I was kind of perusing some pro Wagner kind of Russian nationalists and. They're all um, one thing that they don't like is that Shoigu is like I think he's half Tuvan. Um, so he's not, I mean, obviously he's very corrupt and I think he, he bears a lot of the responsibility for the failure of the Russian military, um, in, in Ukraine. Um, but he's also not even, um, fully ethnically Russian, which is uh, supposedly a reason that Putin put him in there because that kind of makes it him coup proof. Um, because I guess the idea is that Russians wouldn't really accept a, you know, non-ethnic Russian, uh, president mm. or leader. Um, but, you know, these Wagner people who are more ethno-nationalists, they, they don't like Shoigu because of the corruption, but also because of, you know, there's some, there's some ethnic or racial stuff going on there. So I, th- I think if, um, you know, if uh, the Chechen force um, had, had been, had, they, they'd had to be used to, um, to go into Rostov, they, they circled the city, but they never really went in. I think that would have been uh, potentially, you know, very damaging because, you um, I mean, those these ethno nationalists already don't like Putin because he's he's not a he's he is like a civic nationalist, um, you know, having these high ranking non non ethnic Russians. Civic but if they had basically, <laughs> well, well, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but you know, if they had used these these you know these Chechens, who I'm sure you know many of them are not super nice nice guys to to put this down, I think that would have been really, uh, really pissed off these people even more. I mean, the people in Rostov were basically complimenting the, 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 I mean, you think of Wagner as, you know, very tough, um, kind of brutal guys, but apparently they behaved themselves. There were no reports of, you know, theft or, or assaults or anything. They were actually, there were funny videos of like the people arguing, I guess they were like pro Wagner civilians and anti, and then like the Wagner guys would come in and like break it up so that the, so that the civilians wouldn't right. like get into you know fight i saw some so, anyway. of wagner troops um patroning mcdonald's <laughs> so it was, it was, it's just kind of funny to walk into a fast food restaurant in full paramilitary regalia with weapons and things but anyway <laughs> was what it was um yeah, I also get the impression, I don't know if informants know this, but I get the um, they have like a lot of military bases and such in Rostov, so it's not just like an average normal Russian city, so they're probably more pro-military. As I said, it's a bit like San Diego or something. So, yeah. Uh, I'm kind of curious, I'm interested in the Russian shill accounts. So I, I've, uh, I, I tweeted this out um, while I was actually just at the gym before this, but um, Ian Miles Chong he said that the end result of this relatively bloodless coup by Wagner is that Russia is now more united than ever. And I, I also saw something just right before I went on that Michael Tracy was tweeting out the exact same thing. So, you know, they, they can, there can be some group think going on. They can't have just independently reached the same conclusion, but it, it all strikes me as, propaganda and the fact that they were given this line is that's a suggestion that i don't discount so the question now is do you think wagner are gonna take up positions on the front line again or is that is that over because it must in my mind and i'm not saying it's the final word but a part of my brain screams no that can't be they can't ever go back to how things were, right? Um, but if they don't, 
that's a that's a very bad thing overall, but especially during this counteroffensive, right? If 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 Wagner are basically taken from their post, because you had this in Bakhmut where they they Wagner made gains in Bakhmut, and then the Rus- Russian army took their place after around the start of this month, um, and things started to fold from there, and they rapidly started to lose control and uh, organization from there. So yeah, I was wondering what you think about that. Yeah, I mean, I, I would. My feeling right now is that Wagner will return to the front because, you know, again, we're, we're projecting our own sense of idealism and honor upon this whole thing. And, you know, it's like if you do, you know, you, you attack the government directly, you'll have to face the consequences. It's a all or nothing gambit and so on. Well, uh, apparently it was not. And I mean, if I were in charge of a country, a legitimate leader, and someone threatened my authority to this degree, I mean, the, the only answer is he must die. But apparently that's not happening. And reportedly he's hanging out in Belarus with Lukashenko and all is hunky-dory. I mean, it's just bizarre. It's, it's kind of unimaginable. But I think this is just, we're looking at a mafia state. And, you know, you, you kind of get into a little territorial gang war battle, and then, uh, you know, th- that tempers cool, and we go back to normal. That, that apparently is what is happening. I mean, I, I, obviously, I, I don't want to say anything definitively, uh, just because this is an ongoing situation and the misinformation abounds. But that is my impression. Uh, there's another way to put it as well, where it's like a feudal state, where it's just uh, um, like Putin is uh, has almost like the equivalent uh, position of like a medieval king or like a, like a Chinese emperor or something, where where he, where he is, where all these warlords uh, come to, uh, and like feudal lords come to when they have disputes with each other, and uh, he's sort of like. I mean, so he so he's almost like he almost has a more like a judicial function more than a political function, where it's just like I'm going to settle disputes between you lords. Yeah. Also, as well, this this it has crossed my mind. This could be a clever move on the part of Lukashenko, where he sees a future where if if Black, if uh, Wagner are completely sidelined, completely marginalised, he thinks well, perhaps uh, most likely uh, Belarusian troops would be called upon to take a more active role, and he's trying to prevent that, because there has been, it's not really a reported on thing as much, but that has been sort of like an ongoing, uh, you know, diplomatic jockeying yes. or political jockeying, like, you know, Lukashenko's like, oh, I'm, we're totally with Russia, you know, glove in fist, all the rest of it, um, but, you know, don't don't bring our troops, you know, that, down to Zaporizhia or to Bakhmut or to, you know, exactly. <laughs> or to Kharkiv. He might want to be protecting you know. himself with, Wagnerians against uh, Putin uh, laying down the law against Belarus. It's, you know, it's like, listen, you know, there's been talk about our becoming a unitary state. You're our vassal. Do what I say. And Lukashenko could, you know, cling to power with some help from Wagner. I mean, there, there are all sorts of ways you can play this. But to, to, to project idealism into any of these actors, I, I think is just kind of clearly wrong. Yeah, no. I mean, I, I, I do think like uh, Lukashenko is a very interesting character because in the 90s, he actually went to, um, he ran on a platform of pro Russian platform of unity with uh, uh, like uh, Russia, that they, they mm-hmm. got the, uh, like. Uh, like Crimea, and then so with them when he went into power, he sort of had this. Uh, no, we're going to be like pro-Russian, but we're still going to be independent. And so uh, it is kind of interesting because I can also can imagine Lukashenko um, coming out of this uh, like switching side and sort of be like um, gradually moving closer to the West. Uh, because you see this with a lot of other traditionally um, um, Russian allies, you see it with Armenia and Serbia that they are starting to move closer to the European Union now. Well, it doesn't go too well for Russia and Armenia. People never talked about this, but Armenia has like treaty obligation to uh, Russia mm-hmm. and vice versa. For the part of like a defense uh, treaty, yeah. the CSTO. Um, yeah, exactly, and that's actually very interesting because uh, that because this goes back to 2020 and the Karabakh war because that uh, the treaties doesn't really 
um, include disputed territories. And Russia never um, intervened in that conflict, even though it is like vaguely formulated because you can interpret it as um, you shouldn't. It doesn't cover disputed territory, but you also can interpret it as it, as, uh, it should. Um, but Russia didn't intervene on the Armenian side so uh, in that war. And now, until the very end, um, as sort of diplomatic pressure, and uh, so uh, and now the Armenians have like no obligation to intervene on disputed territory on the Russian part. Or any other of the yeah, in many the, ways the yeah. CSTO um, conflict over there as well with the Nagorno Karabakh war also showed the limits of Russian foreign policy in many ways that they really weren't able to effectively create you know a a situation where peace could reign because after all. Last year, we saw Azerbaijan once again engaged in military actions against Armenians. And I mean, as it's looking right now, the way that the Azerbaijani foreign ministry is also talking, it seems that they're planning on engaging in ethnic cleansing policies, while Russia more or less is just sitting here and watching. Hmm. One of the interesting things, though, with the um, the situation that happened here with uh, Wagner in Russia is that we saw a lot of these... Um, Volunteer units in Ukraine suddenly come out and say, oh, we support the coup, like, you know, the our, uh, the Russian Volunteer Corps said that, but now nothing happened. So what what, what kind of position are they left in now? Same with the, um, the Belarusian re- regiment as well, which made, you know, their video today saying, oh, soon the liberation in Belarus will be at wow. hand. It just makes me wonder if they had, like, any real plans going forward, if they were trying to, like, grab the opportunism, thinking something more was going to happen out of this. Because well, um, it was just opportunism, I think. Propagandistic opportunism, really. Yeah. Yeah, I think so, too. Because, like, the, the, the problem with, for instance, the Russian Volunteer Corps is when they say, we pledge allegiance to Wagner, and then nothing happens, how's that going to look now that they have to go back to Ukraine again and now explain to the SBU why it was that their leader said, we now support Prigozhin? Right. Yeah. I mean, th- this is why I just, I, I just think you can't understand any of this if you project idealism onto them. It's, it's, it's mafia bosses, uh, you know, slamming up against each other and then kind of, you know, solidifying back into a status quo. I, I, I think that that is what's happening. And if you try to, like, project any grand plan or anything like that, you're just going to look like a fool. So, Richard, I don't know if this question was already asked, but do you think that this weakens Putin even on a symbolic level? Oh, no question. I mean, I, I, I did address a lot of these things, and, I, and I'll just um, sum it up. But Putin wants a depoliticized society where, you know, it, it's trust the plan, you know, stay calm. Uh, Putin's in charge and all political decisions or all, all politics can be kind of outsourced to him and the public remains silent. But the second you start questioning his legitimacy, the second that, A, there's the prospect of chaos, there's the prospect of instability, there's also the prospect of alternatives, I mean, I, I don't know, you know, we were joking about this, but it, this would be like a, an out of control American general taking over San Diego. I mean, it's kind of funny. And is, is it that significant? You know, San Diego is pretty small and whatever, but it's hugely symbolically significant. You just cannot allow that to happen. And it I massively dis- uh, I'm in agree with that as well. Like the um, the situation here is that we we have a country where the leader was seen as an almost you know untouchable figure for so long, where he had undisputed control over Russian society. There is no way that you can spin a story positively where you in the morning say we're going to crush these rebels and destroy them because they're stabbing Russia in the back like 1917, and by the end of it, you've apparently fled Moscow. These guys are 200 kilometers away from entering your capital. And at the same time, a guy who was supposed to be like your puppet via Lukashenko is the one who has to form a peace agreement with these people. I mean, Putin looks incredibly weak out of this. And I think in many ways, this image of him as this person who's just in control of everything has in many ways been permanently yes. shattered from this. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yes. And I, I don't know where I things think, go yeah. from here. I mean, Obviously, things have, even within 24 hours, things seem to be settled down. 
And so I, I don't think there's just immediate instability in Moscow or anything like that. But I, I don't know where things go from here. Um, the, you know, the, the Ukrainian counteroffensive is um, chugging along, but, but is not really making dr- dramatic gains. But I, I think there is the, the possibility, at least with Putin, might be small, but it's a real possibility of my fundamental objective is to hold on to power and to maintain this. And this is not looking good for me. Like this has threatened my own legitimacy in ways that nothing else has. This is obviously the bridges are burned in terms of uh, outreach to the West. I mean, I, I don't think he even wants that anymore. Um, in a way that they weren't burned earlier, like g- the Georgia campaign, et cetera, his, his, his relations with the West improved after that. And I think he maybe thought that a similar situation was going to occur. Nothing really happened that bad uh, with the annexation of Crimea, bloodless annexation, where Obama didn't go to the mat with Putin while that was happening. And in a way, relations improved by the show of strength. Well, there's just no way you can spend that now. And he's gazing into the abyss of actually losing power or his country falling into chaos. So, I mean, I think there is at least a chance that he, you know, there's the sunk, you know, the sunk cost fallacy, but he just sees this Ukraine adventure as just demoralizing and ruining the basis of his, his support. I mean, most political actors don't act this way. There is no sunk cost fallacy. You, you just, you can't start, if you start something, you've got to end it in most cases because it would be such a, uh, you know, a front to your honor and, 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 and your manliness, let's say. But in this case, I don't know. Um, I could, just speculating here, I, I could see him kind of, pulling back or, or just trying to hold on to his, get, his, his country. Yeah. I can offer like, I don't know my, my, my to yeah, yeah. Radar. Sure. You've been hanging out there. You, you can jump in and then punish can, can address what I just said, but go, go for it. Radar. Oh, okay. F- th- thanks a lot. First of all, uh, thanks for the mic. So I, I, um, you know, I want to offer an opinion, which is like sort of like kind of my own, but like it also comes from like a very knowledge, channel on youtube that talks about the war uh the war in ukraine called like literally war in ukraine you guys can look it up mm-hmm. later it's actually run by a ukrainian guy he's not a new he's not on twitter uh it's, he's pro-ukrainian like but he's like very intelligent you know so he and his theory which he mentioned that like several he's been talking about it for several months which you know the events unfolded in a way that like you know he, he's kind of been vindicated and, and correct what is happening is that, in his opinion, and he has sort of like predicted those events happen today, is that the Kremlin is undergoing a sort of like uh, controlled demolition, right? Um, it has been histor- uh, there is historical precedent that the that they, they the people in the Kremlin are able to pick a new czar. Like there's an old quote in Russia that says like, if the czar won't do what the people want, then the people will get a new czar. And I actually was sort of like not fully bought into this theory, but like the fact that he did everything he did today and he still got away with it. There's a, there's a, an argument to be made that there was a seed planted in the mind of the people, which at the same time, there was a shock, but it was really fast. It did not disturb the front line. So he cannot be accused of like being some, um, you know, being guilty of allowing the Ukrainians to break through, but it also planted a seed. And you saw the, the footage in Rostov, right? The people cheering. And he's also like moving to Belarus. So I think that what the Kremlin insiders are doing is sort of a con- like they're like Putin is on his way out and Prigozhin is going to take over after him. Uh, and Prigozhin is actually a much bigger threat to Ukraine because he's actually very energetic and he offers a sort of like uh, what this channel that I mentioned uh, calls like a positive ideology. Yeah. If you follow his like his quote, you know, and so it's very. Um, I think that we should sort of like understand it for, you know, not see the forest by the trees, if I'm uh, saying the quote correctly. Uh, I think what's happening is a controlled demolition. Like, and Prigozhin, Prigozhin will take over. So if you're the news saying are, a controlled it will demolition be, it, it, of Russia, by whom? Uh, 
uh, it's like a creative destruction, you know, like uh, the, the, the Putin is on his way out, the Prigozhin will take over because essentially like uh, uh, the, the state as it is, in, this is like, I'm, I'm, I'm like uh, echoing the fury of this guy, which I highly recommend this channel, uh -huh. um, is uh, he, he claims that, uh, you know, uh, that um, the, the, the Russia, Russia and Ukraine for that matter, and he, he are going to its 1917 moment. And, and Russia is ahead of Ukraine on its 1917 no moment, but Wagner and Wagner ideology is sort of uh, sort of like what will replace the sort of statist, like very like slow, um, sort of like this kind of bureaucratic like kind of uh, system that is Russia. And Wagner offers an alternative. You know, I don't know if you guys know, but Wagner has a bunch of movies out. Like they've made like at least four movies already. They're very active in psychological operations in the middle of Africa, in Syria. I mean, I recommend you guys check it out. I mean, it's available on YouTube mm -hmm. with subs and all that. So I think that the, the, what like Prigozhin is sort of like demonstrating is, is this alternative. And I think the Kremlin, uh, uh, you know, elites that kind of understand that it's inevitable. So they're like con like they're doing a controlled demolition where like you know Putin will be out, Prigozhin will be in your czar. It, it won't. It, it, today was like a taste. It was like a shock and a pullback. So people got really anxious, and, and, but they also like pondered the idea. They're like, "What if? Like, what if this guy takes over? Like, he, he does offer something, you know?" And uh, and I think that the Kremlin and the fact that he's going to Belarus, he, he's not being executed or anything. That shows that there is like, like I said, a controlled demolition, which, which is actually, you know. I'm, I'm echoing a lot well, of what I know, this channel says. I mean, you know, look, I, I, by, by the, by, by the elites, you know, for, for, for example, like the, the system, right? Like if you understand, yeah, a I country do have a question as, about uh, that, though, if you don't mind it, because um, I sure. thought that the reactions of Surovikin and Kadrov were interesting because they, for a long time, were uh, publicly at least aligning themselves along with Prigozhin. And when they today decided to break with him after Putin made his speech, I thought it was actually significant to the uh, to the issue of whether or not Wagner had any allies at the highest levels. So if what you're saying is true, then I think you'd expect to see some sign of, I don't know, some sort of tacit sympathy, uh, particularly among those two individuals, Surovikin and Kadyrov. But today they did the opposite. But if, yeah. you, if you saw the, the rhetoric that they did was not a harsh rhetoric. It was essentially a, ple a pledge to come down. I think like what Prigozhin was waiting, and this isn't necessarily like my theory, but I do subscribe to it as well, which is like Prigozhin was expecting in many ways that the, maybe the Russian lines would break. Like maybe the Ukrainians would like, you know, be doing a lot better than they are right now. And they're not. Like the Russian army is actually holding the line pretty well and advancing in a few places. So like it's fair to say the Ukrainian counteroffensive is a failure at this point. So I guess he was waiting uh, that the Ukrainian counteroffensive would be more successful. Hence, a push would be, you know, would get more momentum. It didn't, but at the same time, he was not executed. Like nothing happened. But if you if you think about it, this like very coldly, like of all the possible outcomes that could have happened, it's literally the best one available because it's like you planted the seed in everybody's head. You know, he showed that, uh, that, that there is a. That, the, the, the Kremlin or whatever Russia as a an biological entity is already like naturally and organically creating alternatives. And the guy is literally just moving to Belarus. I mean, that's like textbook, nothing. Like it, it is very surprising. You know, apparently he shot down a helicopter and he's just like chilling in Belarus until this is my opinion. And I don't think this is necessarily a conspiracy theory that somebody like wrote it down. I think this is like a very organic, creative destruction to sort of bring back a positive ideology to Russia, which would, you know, okay. sort of win okay. in Ukraine. I because, get it. I, I, you, you've said yeah. your piece. I, I think what you're saying is highly speculative, um, but you do have, like, there, there are some kernels of truth that I agree with, such as that whatever you want to say about Wagner, there, there is, like, a sort of, kind of, sort of badass imperialism ideology there. Um, but in terms of, you also seem to be kind of like playing out your fantasy <laughs> in the sense that like the system is going to bring this about. I, I think it's just much more plausible to suggest that these are gangland guys. They're slamming up against each other and then they just kind of move off. And I think Wagner is weakened by this 
uh, you know, if you have a really badass ideology, then you should go to balls to the wall and take out Putin and install yourself. And I don't, anyway, I, I'm going to mute you. But, but you're, I mean, you're, I, you've said you're, peace, man. Um, I mean, yeah, I, I do think this is very interesting about the position of Wagner because Russia doesn't really have like the rule of law. So it all depends on if the if like the uh, top guy approves of you or not. So yeah. it's quite interesting. So uh, we had a couple. Hands it's also forward. difficult to say that, you know, Vac uh, like Wagner has like all of this um, elitist support when we didn't really see it materialize whatsoever mm -hmm. in this you know, yeah, attempt. Exactly. Like we, we saw we saw a lot of groups, actually, a lot of oblast governors and republic governors coming out immediately as saying we support the president, we support Putin. So. I, and also to me, just based on the way that Wagner was doing this, there wasn't like any real attempt to take control of like administrative centers. They were basically beelining it for Moscow, which to me also to a degree almost uh, shows a form of um, desperation with the Prigozhin that he wanted to get to Moscow because that is where power is centralized at the end of the day. And there was a lot of discussion early on that why is Wagner going to Rostov? Because true, there isn't any really important government centers there. And maybe that was also something that, you know, Prigozhin realized. One thing I wanted to point out, though, was you, you were discussing earlier about um, Putin being tied to the war in Ukraine and if he can just move out of it. And um, I, I don't think that it's that easy because the stakes have become so high for Putin in this yeah. war in a sense that he has tied a lot of his legacy to this war. He has tied the idea of the Ruski Mir, you know, this Russian world to the reunification of Belarus and Ukraine, that the little Russians must be brought into the fold yeah. again. Anything less than something that can, you know, plausibly be sold as a victory um, will be seen as a massive defeat. And this means that for Russia, at the very least, they need to guarantee Ukraine is never allowed to join the European Union or NATO, because mm. at the end of the day, um, that is what um, they supposedly fear. And otherwise, the, you know, the, the nationalist Nazis or whatever that the Russians keep on talking about the Ukrainians, like they will end up, have, uh, they will still have gotten their goal at the end of the day. And I do believe at the end of the day that Ukraine will either become part of NATO or something very, very close yes. to it, because there's no other real alternative for the security situation in Eastern Europe than this. I and also in terms of when we talk about the, with the Ukrainian offensive, right, because it was said earlier that the U offensive has failed. I do think it's a bit early to say that because, again, we haven't seen the majority of Ukrainian, uh, Ukraine's um, combat brigades even be employed. We haven't seen a single Mada on the front yet or even a single Challenger. We've seen a couple of Leopards and a couple of Bradleys that were taken out in some localized attacks that failed. But considering how massive the Ukrainian assault brigades are and... Um, how much you know manpower is left potentially to fight? I don't think we've even seen like the real main assault thrust happen yet. I think that's true. Yeah, according to what I've read, the, there were only three brigades involved in the attack in Zaporozhye, and I think that there and are they six nine total still in reserve. Hmm. Interesting, um, Kevin. Th those are some very good points. Punished, uh, Kevin. You have the floor. You've had your hand up for a little while. Ah, uh, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. This is a question for Richard. And it's a little bit out there, a little bit weird, but um, do you see any connection, no matter how far out between <laughs> Wagner and this, and then Wagner, the legendary composer that you like to talk about? <laughs> and also, you once said that Wagner, the composer, was a terrible person. And um, I know that's a little bit off topic, but I that just really made me wonder what you mean about that. And I don't really know anything about him, but it just was interesting to me. Oh, okay. There, there apparently is a connection. So Prigozhin is not the founder of Wagner. Uh, it's another gentleman. D does someone have his name right now? He uh, D uh, Dmitry Utkin, I think, was yes, his name. Yes, thank you. And he had SS tattoos. Wagner was actually his call sign. And supposedly this was this uh he's a nazi enthusiast and uh Vog wagner was the favorite composer uh of hitler and you know hitler was actually devoted to wagner in, in his early life he would uh sketch scenic um you know you know uh, uh, scenes in an opera wagnerian operas he actually would send troops to Bayreuth at some point during the war. I mean, his devotion to Wagner was uh, pretty immense. There, there are a lot of connections there. 
uh, Wagner was a, a horrible person, but I, I think I was making the point that sometimes horrible people create great works of art, or maybe you need to be a little bit of a horrible person in order to create something as, as grandiose as, as the ring cycle. Uh, so, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not a Wagnerian myself. I do. I love Wagnerian operas. I think he's a fascinating person. Uh, but I, I wasn't saying he was a horrible person to like diminish him. I mean, in terms of like sleeping with other men's wives, taking out loans and then fleeing the country, being a complete narcissist jerk. I mean, that, that is Wagner himself. <laughs> I mean, you just can't get away from it. Uh, but, you know, he gave himself leeway because he was a great genius. And when you are a great genius and an amazing composer, then you get away with it. Um, okay, so cyber ideology. Do you want to jump in? Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, as usual, maybe I'll just um, give you a kind of contrarian view. Apparently, Wagner couldn't <sighs> ever operate on Russian territory. Mm -hmm. So, and they've always like operated in Africa and and uh, yeah, non-Russian territory. So, when the new regions of Ukraine became incorporated under uh, into Russia uh, while the war was being prosecuted. Uh, Wagner was apparently like they were just left to do what they were doing, which was um, taking uh, uh, doing the meat grinder in Bakhmut. Right. But um, they'd already been told that they once they were finished, they'd have to be folded into the command structure of the Russian military. And so Prigozhin. Uh, is a very rich guy, and but he's an independent guy, and he. Uh, um, so people are saying that he would bridle under the yoke. He couldn't. Sure. He couldn't just be subservient to, um, you know, the the military hierarchy of Russia. So some people are just saying that it was because of this that this was his way of um, maintaining his independence in some way, and that like it would it could never be a coup because the number of forces were too small. And also the entire country sort of were unified against them. So all the politicians came out and said, uh, you know, we don't support this. The military. Uh, well, okay, I see your point here. And you're yeah. making rational points, but. Okay, can I just never, want to say one thing before you resp respond? Okay, but Richard, nevertheless, you can't. Yeah. This was my joke about an hour ago, which is that. Yeah. You know, if I were a military general, I would just take over San Diego and be like, oh, hey, guys, do you mind if I just yeah. keep San Diego as my personal fiefdom? I won't challenge. Like, you cannot yeah. allow such a thing to happen. I mean, even if this couldn't have succeeded, the boldness yeah. of driving tanks towards Moscow is just yeah. so outrageous. <clears throat> it is it is outrageous, but what would have been what would have been the worst outcome? The worst outcome would have been a direct clash and lots of bloodshed. And they need those um soldiers and those those weaponries to prosecute their war. So in a way, like what you describe as chaos and whatever, it it actually has been resolved with like very little bloodshed. So oh, in yeah. a way it it's uh, kind of it shows that diplomacy and the co negotiation um, is it's not it's not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of of strength. And I think people here they're like they're projecting their what their desires of what they want all this to be onto what's happening. Like so, and and their idea of what Russia is onto what's happening, and then and always bringing it back to Putin. But I mean, there's like. There's a much wider context in what's happening, so um, yeah, it's. Uh, I think I, I don't. I think they really disagree with what you're saying, but I I, mm. I, I, I think you're just trying to kind of spin it. Of this is such a sign of Putin's civilizational consciousness or something. I mean, mm. this is not good. I mean, no, I, I just yeah. I, I no, it's definitely it's definitely Richard. not good, but it it doesn't it doesn't show it doesn't show the the chaos and the disintegration of the Kremlin and uh, you know all these kind of um, whenever doom and gloom questions your power is that mm -hmm. is showing demonstrating chaos. Like it, you know, if if Biden had gone down and shaken hands with J six protesters, 
would you mm-hmm. say? And, and he said, oh, let's just go have a beer and work this out and reach a compromise. Do you, do you think that would have demonstrated strength? Um, yeah, I, I think um, like if you resolve thing to the greatest strength you can have is to resolve things peacefully. Yeah, I, I, I understand. But I, I mean, it, you know, there's a time and a place and there's mm. there's a time and a place for everything. There's a time and a place to kind of reach a compromise with someone and not push them up against mm. the wall. I mean, that that's also classic military strategy. You always want mm-hmm. to give someone a way out. You don't want to, yeah. you know, get an injured animal that has nothing to lose and back yeah. up against a wall. It's gonna, it's gonna just lash out. And, yeah, he's he's, just, he's essentially suicide, like, uh, but, yeah, he's essentially. Yeah. Like, Maybe not like, agree uh, with you there. It just seems like you're kind of like. Well, somebody was saying that. To say that Putin is good, actually. No, it's no, like, I'm, not, I'm not saying that. I'm just he saying has that. Like, been delegitimized by this. There's mm. No possible like other solution the, to this like he's or, or, putin, or other interpretation of this putin has already delegitimized in the west you know like he's he I has no delegitimized in russia but i don't think so because i mean before oh, this the russian people ridiculous. support putin and after this the russian people support putin their main concern if you're imagine put yourself into the shoes of an ordinary russian your main concern is that you're at war with the West via the Ukrainian proxy. That is your only concern. So then you have this rogue general who's who's like that um, figure in Apocalypse Now, who's you know got a bit of a cult status, and you know he's been traumatized by the uh, you know the eight month battle in Bakhmut. He's seen his like comrades die. He's wealthy. He's you know we, he's got like whatever issues we don't know. So he's gone kind of rogue. So the the imperative thing then is just to resolve what's happening this like chaotic event in you know diffuse it with the the least amount of bloodshed and that's what's happened and like beyond that i don't think any of us can kind of say what's going to happen for the russian military what they want is to diffuse the situation and get back to prosecuting the war in ukraine and that's what they've done in the matter of 24 hours you know so and all all other ideas about like how Putin is weak and uh, how the Kremlin is imploding is just like Western, you know, fantasies. Like, of course, uh, a Ukrainian, ask about that? of course, a Ukrainian person is going to desire that that the Kremlin, you know, is going to go through a, a controlled demolition. But like, that's just not going to happen. You know, like Russia has survived as an entity for hundreds of years. Their 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 general staff you know, of the army is like 150 years old. It's like, like there's all these, it's, it's just wishful thinking on our part to think that um, it's this fragile entity that like with one kind of destabilizing event is just going to fall over. You know, okay. if they could stop. Okay, you've laugh. said your piece. You've said your piece. I mean, can, can I, I just ask, uh, can I ask something? I mean, where were all these like pro Putin supporters in Moscow? I mean, there was like no one out in the street, as I said, with like a Turk example, where you had like Islamists who defending Erdogan in 2016. You had like nothing of that in, Mos- in Moscow today or in Rosta. We have people who said, like, yes, uh, yes, I would die for Putin, or I would like get shot by, by Wagner to, to, for Putin. Like, none of that existed. Like, he has like no supports whatsoever. And just to point out, the Russian general staff or whatever is not 150 years old. I don't know if people like forget what happened in the 1930s when Stalin went through a massive purge of the entire, you know, Russian general staff and basically replaced him with a bunch of young officers. The, uh, there's not this like weird, long traditional history in the Russian general staff where they all follow one another. The doctrine has changed repeatedly throughout time. And, and actually, in, in many ways, the um, the claim that there is this like long arc to all these things is almost like a reinforcement of this Russian imperial dream that actually the Soviet Union was really just a, a continuation of the Russian Empire in right. an utter paint. It's a it's a very it's a very like Russian you know ethno nationalistic based idea of like oh that these traditions they keep on existing, and again the, the, this this pro- problem was saying that like there's no negative consequences from this and oh it doesn't matter if Putin looks weak or not. I mean, simply speaking, in the short term, that might be true. Yes, for the next two, two, three, four weeks, maybe months, we won't see anything truly happen from this because the war is going to take center stage. But 
as the war drags on, as this, either we continue having a stalemate or we get Ukrainian advances, because I don't think Russian advances are highly likely, um, this is going to start ch- changing more and more and more as people re- remember, hey, there were literally tanks rolling through the highways towards Moscow. There were air defenses shooting down Russian planes, Russian helicopters, killing Russian pilots. And the end result of it was that Putin just stood and watched. And that is something people will remember. And that is something especially the elites will remember that do exist behind the system. Well, I don't think there's some kind of big plot by the elites currently to take out Putin or whatever. I do think everybody is paying attention to that we currently had a president who sat and said he was going to bring fire and fury upon the traitors. And then he just let them run towards Moscow without any type of intervention whatsoever. What was he meant to do? Kill them. What he was meant exactly. What he was meant to do is hang they them. need they need those troops and weaponry and armor and all I'm that. I'm sorry, but this is this is ridiculous. We're not talking about sending the Russian army to go from Ukraine to fight in the street in the streets of Moscow. We're talking about the VKS and the VVS, which which obviously were there because there were helicopters flying and at one point also engaged like a single UAZ. They weren't really there. They didn't stop the adv- advance. They didn't even really harass them. They went over there, did one attack, and then one of them also got shot down by Estrella 10. Like, I'm sorry, but they looked absolutely ridiculous. And you cannot claim, oh, they just had, had to focus on the war. Again, the Russian Air Force is more than just a couple dozen helicopters and airplanes. We're talking about potentially hundreds of planes, unless you think that actually the entire Russian Air Force has been just destroyed by the Ukrainians, which clearly isn't the case. So something happened here. For whatever reason, the Russian VVS and VKS did not intervene when they should have, because that is what would have made Putin look strong, by having masses of burnt-out Wagner columns lining the roads outside Rostov, not having them almost get to fucking Moscow before they finally got turned over, because Prigozhin said, hey, we struck a deal. By the way, it was Lukashenko who did it, while Putin sat in his bunker and, I don't know, played video games or whatever. Yeah. So these are experienced troops. They've been fighting in Ukraine. They've got combat experience. And why, what be- benefit would it be to the Russian military to destroy these troops? There would be no benefit. And they're also fellow Russians. And they're obeying... Hold on a second. They're obeying the order. They're obeying the order. Hold on a second. Hold on a Hold on a second. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. Russians killing one another is a pretty normal phenomenon. Yeah. Why don't you hold on, Cyber? Punish was saying basically that the notion of, you know, some racial unity among Russians is... A bit fantastical. They're absolutely willing to kill one another. But you you can respond to that, Cyber. And then I kind of want to move off this topic because I just, I I mean, to be frank, you're you're a nice guy, rational guy, respectful. I I just find your argument completely uncompelling. But go for it. Okay. So the last thing I'm going to say is that the troops themselves, um, they may. We don't know what they were told, so they wouldn't have be. You can't see them as culpable. Only the the main guy himself, Brugosian, right? So, why would you destroy your, you know, potential military force? It just from a. I, I know you're saying it's rational, but I mean, if yeah, it's rational, you then don't challenge the government. With, with a, like I don't know what to tell you if you. E, 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 it, it is not like a domestic dispute or something where there, uh, it's a police action and the government will kind of arrest whoever's, whoever is guilty. If you are directly assaulting the government, the government will kill you. Like, it, there, there is no other way. They didn't need to kill all of Wagner, they, but they probably should have made a show of it and they should have had Prigozhin hanged. I mean, th- there's just no other way that you address something that bold. You know, you can kind of criticize Putin here and there and get away with it. You can say all this bold, emotional stuff, which Progrosian is famous for. You start directly assaulting the government, talking of regime change or, or dictating to the government what they, they should do. Oh, you should get rid of that general, keep that one, get rid of Shoigu, et cetera. You just do not, you cannot do that. 
it, it, it's it's like a child, you know, a, 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 gaining sovereignty over his parents or something, saying no, no, actually, we're going to eat candy all day and play video games. <laughs> you cannot allow that to happen. Um, but I mean, the Russian military is way more powerful than this one rogue commander and his troops. So they they wouldn't be they they wouldn't be showing their power or strength. I, I, I just, I just, you know, all they would be doing is just destroying uh, resources that they need to prosecute the war in Ukraine. I mean, what you're saying is like when you say there's no other way. I mean, there apparently is because we've been shown today that there is another way that you can resolve um, You can just allow people to do whatever the hell they want and then flee the country with no consequences. Yes, there is another way. What we're saying is that that other way is utterly delegitimizing. But anyway, I am going to end this discussion here because I just don't find this very productive. Um, I, I do like you, Cyber, but this is just not compelling. Okay. Um, I'll go to James. yeah. You, you 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 can't really hate people with like a uh, nice English accent like that. It's I don't hate Cyber, and he, he's a nice guy. I and he's always he's rational and respectful. Yeah, but come on, give me a nice break. accent. <laughs> okay, uh, <laughs> Jack, you can go. Oh well, it's about um Pergosian, and I know you wanted to kind of get off that topic, but just some of my thoughts. No, no, I just wanted to move off this, like, this was a sign of strength, what just happened. I I just Okay, well, I was thinking if he really wanted to do some damage, I think he should have stayed in Ukraine and tried to incite more mutiny amongst the conscripted troops in particular, because, I mean, they would be more susceptible to that. And trying to drive Mm -hmm. to Moscow and, you know, fight Putin in the Kremlin, like, his security forces, Putin's personal forces are, like, 40,000 strong, and, like, I think he. Had, I think Pergosian had like what ten thousand with them. So, I mean that that's just what I was thinking. I just wanted to add that. Right. I I, I don't know how many were with him. There there is a. I've heard twenty five and fifty thousand. I would have to get, um, uh, learn about that. But um, yeah. I um I again I think the 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 ultimate answer to this is that this wasn't terribly se- serious. This was a mob boss talking big who wasn't willing to, to go to the mat over this. He might be willing to shoot down a helicopter, but he wasn't willing to die. This, this wasn't some ultimately grand gesture. It was a bullshit gesture to get to, to address some kind of problem that he saw, whether it was having Wagner uh, integrated into the armed forces, having Wagner killed, which again, as I said an hour or so ago, I don't, I don't think that that was a completely unreasonable fear on Prigozhin's part that, the, that Shoigu might just get rid of uh, Wagner, get rid of, decapitate Wagner at the very least, uh, just because he is a threat to the sovereignty of the Russian military. Um, okay, we have Klaus Schwab here. Wow, uh, really remarkable. Thank you for joining us, Klaus. Anytime, anytime. <laughs> um, so, so basically, we did kind of see some videos on Telegram floating around where they, some like units did like swear fealty to Wagner, frontline units. Yeah. But that ended up turning into the biggest nothing burger of all time. Nothing changed. Yes. Like we don't, we didn't hear anything like frontline, uh, like uh, disarray or like infighting. I did see those as well. And uh, I, again, it's, it's this weird thing about following something on social media where you can inflate just some little tidbit of information. And this in- information might be wrong, in fact. But yeah, I mean, that, that's why I had trouble going to sleep before like 3.30 a.m. last night because I, I was just watching the timeline and more things were coming in. And I, I didn't want to go to sleep because I was like, holy shit, uh, maybe the uh, the Russian armed forces are going to change sides, you know, because uh, you, you could see a little tidbit that would suggest that. But I, again, when I woke up, it had amounted to very little. 
Uh, like, what was happening? I was at a bar with friends and stuff, like drinking and then looking at Twitter, Telegram, and they're like, what the hell is going on? And I'm like, I'm surrounded by these normies. I cannot talk about this. <laughs> what were the normies saying? I'm curious. Like, okay, so I'm living in Denmark. And uh, while they're really supportive of Ukraine, they don't really talk about it. Okay, there are some exceptions of uh, people that actually really are interested, but uh, the majority is... Like, yeah, we support Ukraine, but we don't really care. Yeah. yeah. Like, very benign support. But, uh, like, well, how should I say this? It's not really much of a topic of discussion, especially about, uh, around my IRL group of friends. Yeah. Like, they just told me, hey, just stop talking about Ukraine. <laughs> Every time. So, like, so I learned my lesson. I'm not talk about Ukraine amongst the normies. I'm going to keep talking the schizo shit with my online friends. That's sure. where I keep it. Yeah. Punish, do you want to jump in? Yeah, it's actually interesting because I mean, I'm from Denmark as well. And it is, um, it is true what um, the Schwabster there, he says that a lot of um, civilians, they're not really all that interested in the deeper conversations about us. Um, however, this does change also in the um, areas that you're in. So, for instance, um, I'm in the Danish army. I've been um, a soldier for a bit over a year now. And the Ukraine war is like, I think that literally basically everyone talks about there all the time It's like, mm -hmm. you can't get away from it that people there, um, like you, you sit in your station and then it's like, yo, did you see this video from telegram dude? That's so sick. And I mean, in my experience, um, the support at least, uh, among soldiers is more or less like completely pro Ukrainian. So it is, I mean, it is interesting how different parts of a society will have different reactions to it. Yeah, I mean, I, this is something that I've talked a lot about. I, I do find it amazing the degree to which conservatives in the United States, and not all of them, I would say that most of the public is kind of benignly, somewhat indifferently predisposed towards Ukraine. But the degree to which average conservatives have flipped sides and are in fact just outright pro-Russian in the United States. I, I find that remarkable, um, just knowing even the recent history of the American right. And yeah, it's ridiculous. If I remember correctly, Mitt Romney literally said, said like back in 2012 that Russia was one of America's biggest enemies. And yes. it was Obama who said the Cold War cult, they want the foreign policy back. And exactly. we, you, you know, eight, hour, uh, eight years later and mm -hmm. suddenly Everything has changed. Now suddenly standing with um, Putin is standing against a woke leftist um, globo homo agenda or whatever. Yeah. Ignoring well, the fact that Russia like actively Peterson, pushes those things in the West, too. Yeah. I mean, like someone like Jordan Peterson said this. I'll give two examples. And it, this was uh, might have been a year ago. But Jordan P Peterson was saying that, like, he was making a weird like NATO enlargement argument but he he uh, he substituted woke so he was like woke is in creep is, is creeping in to russians russia's territory and so putin realizes that you have to strike out against it first and early and it, it, you know and otherwise you yourself might become transsexual you know, it's it, fascinating I, to have that I, view I, I, considering I, I, half of yeah. nato is very very conservative not just yeah. eastern europe but take countries like turkey or or you know greece and then talk to me about like how nato is just you know sneaky woke global homo organization that wants to make everyone gay when you know multiple of their founding members are still very conservative to this day right yeah there's no doubt i mean it's it's a weird it, it's a very weird phenomenon I don't think this is taken with most of conservatives, but it has taken with many. And I even saw some other people like Laura Loomer, who is this, um, she has a huge Twitter following at this point. She's a Trump fanatic and, um, you know, uh, interesting woman, uh, I guess you could say. Um, but she talks about this being, you know, this was a CIA coup attempt and so on. Other people have suggested that Bergosia might be paid off by the West or and he's he's in contact with, Ukrainian forces that seem to be leaked by the Tishera Discord leaks uh, a few months ago. I, I think there might be a lot of chicken feed in, in those leaks, but I, I don't want to get into that. But the fact is, it's clear that she sympathizes with Putin. Like, she's not just offering this opinion or speculation. She 
sympathizes with Putin. She's like the evil CIA, the deep state that's attacking average Americans is also trying to take out Putin. And so it's, it's just been a remarkable turn of events in my- It's also, it's also very fascinating with the, um, this idea that it's the United States that's behind all of these things is in many ways a, almost a uh, flattering of the US State Department that apparently they are able to be everywhere all at once and could do every single coup in the world that yeah. apparently Biden, you know, at the stroke of a pen can create a coup in one of the biggest geopolitical enemies the U.S. has to, I guess, hide the story about Hunter Biden's laptop. Exactly. I mean, if, that, if, if this is true, here, if this is Wake true, up, then, I, then Biden is like the biggest genius in the world if he can just do that. Like, I'm sorry, but like, you've got to respect that kind of riz. Yeah, it's like they've got more dick pics of my son. So like, all right. He calls Prigozhin that. being like, we need to destroy them now. <laughs> the Tuvarish. We will. The dick pics will be hidden under a sea of Russian corpses. <laughs> it is truly bizarre. Uh, um, okay. Uh, let's go uh, to some other speakers. So, uh, six Yukimanai. Okay, Zuki Man. Yeah, Zuki Man. Zuki Man. Zuki Man. I had to change okay. my display over. Uh, okay terms of service reasons but um here's the thing i you know i well i don't know if the topic is still on russia but it just it's so it feels really unreal for because if you told me like six hours ago if this is if this is going to happen with uh Prigozhin just oh yeah we changed our mind we're just gonna head back to the front like it's so ridiculous like it's it's very unreal like this you know if this was like a script for a tv show you wouldn't like people wouldn't believe it. They would just write, like say it's it's so like so stupid, you yeah. know. Like everyone has lost face over this. They shot down helicopters. They were they took over a headquarters in Rostov, and then like, um, I mean, I, I, I you know, we could I could sum it all. I mean, I don't want to have to sum it all up, but it, it's it's just sort of like this weird odd prisoners like dilemma situation where both choose to do something where it's like, um, they both kind of lose. And, but it's like mutually self-assured destruction in a different way where Prigozhin, you know, you know, bl blinks, so does, but so does Putin, because Putin doesn't actually name him as a traitor, technically, like in that, in that address he did last night. Right. And there's still, and then he's also now saying, well, we're going to sign over um, all of Wagner to our MOD in contracts and stuff like that. And... It, it, it's so it's so bizarre. I just wouldn't. I I can't believe what just happened. Basically, it's a very unreal moment that I I, I got to see, um, kind of transpire transpire on uh, on Twitter. Oh and yeah, then... no. I mean, I, as I was saying, I didn't want to go to sleep last night because I, I was like, I don't want to miss this. Like, we're we're just watching history unfold, and then I, I eventually did go to bed, and I woke and the... up and it was like, oh. You know, that's, that's the, the other weird thing is just that if it, this is what TV show, it's like the anti cliffhanger cliffhanger. Yeah. There's no climax to it. It's just like Prokosin decides he's going to just change his mind after saying he's going to, you know, uh, cross into Moscow, take it over. And, and then allegedly Putin, you know, ran away to St. Petersburg on his plane. Like, it's yeah, so bizarre. There was a report of that. Yeah, it's amazing. And then, um, I mean, it was. I mean, it's funny too because I, I don't know if you you remember the inauguration of Donald Trump back in like, uh, and it was okay. It was twenty seventeen. Yeah. And you know, I remember, I remember it, it yes. watching it on TV. Everyone was so weirded out. Like, you know, this guy was become like Donald has become president of the United States. He's being inaugurated. I, I remember watching that on TV, going, you know, if this was written in the House of Cards, like two seasons ago. Everyone would have said like how fucking they would have just you know blasted the scriptwriters for how stupid they are, and and it's kind of like the same thing. It's just unreal. I mean, I I, I still want to see what happens next, but it's just yeah, yeah. No, I I totally agree. Okay, we have a couple hands up. Uh, I'll, I'll go to Mythica because you haven't spoken yet. Is that our myth yeah. mythical gaming? M mythical gaming, and okay. yeah. Well, today was very um big. Well, I was doing blend. I was doing 3D modeling, and I always had to switch to see what's happening because 
me and my me and my dad would carry on talking about this situation in my flat, like in my house. And like was it I think you no know, yesterday me and him stayed up to like five in the morning in UK to see what will happen. And like was it now after the precaution left? I wonder what will happen now. Like I don't understand. Because he didn't achieve like his goals against the Russian MOD. And like now what what will they do now? I heard that like they're going to Belarus and I don't think Lukashenko yeah. wants. Okay. I'm sorry, but I don't I I Yeah. We we've we've discussed all this stuff. You can't just jump into a space and um talk about stuff that's already been addressed. Um okay. Um I'll go to a new speaker that is Edmund Wilson. You have to unmute yourself, Edmund. Hi. Hi, sorry. Um, yeah, I thought I would just say that what seems to me to be the case is that this coup is more likely than not something that probably has some kind of Western backing. I mean, it seems unlikely that it doesn't at this stage. And... <laughs> I mean, I know this is a bit of a conspiracy theory for people, but in all likelihood, the Wagner Group are mercenaries. And it does seem that Putin has won by basically standing his ground. A lot of people were saying that Wagner were going to take Moscow, that they were going to go on to depose Putin. But ultimately, I think Wagner slash the West really have failed. I don't think this is embarrassing for Putin. I think this has strengthened his position. But yeah, that's, that's just my view. I might be wrong. Okay. We kind of address that. I mean, look, when you say something like, was, was Prigozhin paid off to do this? I think there's some plausibility to that, just in the sense that he is a mercenary, as you say, and he might have felt under pressure and wanted a way out and the West wants to weaken Moscow. I mean, I, I think there's some plausibility of that, but there, there's no real evidence. And it is curious that he fled to Belarus as opposed to totally defecting and going to the East. But I mean, again, you know, maybe, but there's just no real serious evidence for that. Um, I don't want to relitigate this, but the notion that Putin has been strengthened by this 24 hour episode is just something I cannot abide. I mean, it, it's just no is, is the answer. There is no way that some coup strengthens the government. Uh, Punished, you probably want to react to this and offer more detail than I have. Yeah, I mean, um, it's interesting, the, um, you know, the notion that it could have been the West and is behind this, but I actually think it's a lot simpler than that. I don't think there has to be these, you know, hidden motivations by outside actors as if, you know, Prigozhin has no agency himself to make this decision. After all, like, most people who followed the Ukraine war relatively closely um, have been aware of the conflict between the Ministry of Defense and uh, Wagner and Prigozhin, right? Right. Ever be, so basically since uh, at least March, it became increasingly difficult. And um, after the Russian government, you know, gave out this ultimatum at the start of, I think it was started this month or end of last month, that all of these private contractors had to officially sign a contract with the Russian military, they basically told Prigozhin, we're taking all 25,000 of your guys and we'll make them our guys. Like, there's Every motivation for a man like Prigozhin, who knows that he's a tar uh, t has a target on his back by the Russian Ministry of Defense, that he's not just going to silently lay down and take it. So even if we just talk from a purely selfish perspective, what Prigozhin did here made a lot of sense. There doesn't have to be any Western backing in it. And honestly, if there were Western backing in it, I think that we would have seen it happen differently than what actually went on here. Because... Why would he demand that the incompetent leadership in the Ministry of Defense be, you know, replaced with people who will take it more things more seriously? That doesn't right. make any sense. It's the West that's behind us. Why did he lead a relatively bloodless drive onto um, the capital and then not do anything at the end of the day if it was the West that paid him? Because you would think that the West would want as much chaos as possible. I mean, there, again, like, it just seems to me that there's a lot of this, um, like, reading more into things when there's a lot, much simpler explanation and when it's a lot more logical when you actually, like, understand the background to what's happened here. I agree. 
Can I mean, I there, there's right. like another point about this that uh, it's almost, I think of like when Laplace introduced this model of the solar system to Napoleon and he, Napoleon asks this famous story, um, um, like, I don't see God anywhere in your model. Uh, and Laplace uh, answered like, yeah, everything works perfectly fine without it. And it's like the same thing here. Like, you don't need no outside forces. Everything just fits. It's like puzzle pieces. Yeah. Can I briefly I respond to that? Sure. Yeah, I think I, I, I get the idea that, you know, the simple explanation is this was a Russian civil war. But if we look at the history of so-called Russian civil wars, they're not usually civil wars. I mean, just look at the last one where Lenin's Reds were fighting the Western-backed whites. And initially, kind of the West tried to downplay its involvement. But it turns out that the West was backing everyone and eventually sent in its own troops. Of course, this didn't go everyone. on for long enough for that to happen. But yeah, I think ultimately, I, I, I don't think this is true whatsoever. Um, again, the, the, this wasn't really a civil war either, and we're not talking about this being a Russian civil war. And again, if we look at it historically, when you say that the whites were the Western-backed ones, I mean, the the Soviets had massive amounts of international volunteers from Western countries as mm -hmm. well. Um, and I mean, beyond that, the the whites were the legitimate government at the time i mean let's remember the interim government was the one that the soviets ended up having to coup so right. I, I think there's a there's a there's it's it's a very very different situation here between the russian civil war and what happened here and again this is a problem i have is that you you take a lot of agency away from other nations that exist and that they might have their own interests that people in there might themselves want to choose to do something in many ways you have the most incredibly west-centric view of them all and that is that everybody only does something in a reaction to something the west does and uh, sadly as much as I believe that the West is definitely the best ex place in the world, I don't think that we have this this global control that we can just start civil wars and coups in our biggest geopolitical enemies at the stroke of a pen. Again, I mean, otherwise we would probably be seeing civil wars raging, raging through China and other places too currently. We, yeah. we can and we do start civil wars around the place, and that's what the West has done for the past 20, 30 years. So I think we're very capable of causing a lot of chaos. Yeah, okay, if so to. this is just the sta same standard, you know, leftist, like, oh, everything is the West, nobody has agency. It is just Europe and America behind everything. Well, and um, China, I mean, and China. China has agency. Yeah, China it, has exactly. Agency. Yeah, quod erat demonstrandum. You're like kind of proving my point here. You don't believe that other nations and other people have any form of agency. That's they correct. I don't believe that anybody has yeah. agency apart from America and China. That's completely that correct. That is literally, yeah, that is literally what you're saying here. And it's it is kind of what you're saying. Stupid is the problem. Opinion. I'm it's sorry, but it, it, it's, it's correct. It's, uh, it's, it's correct. No. What I'm saying is correct. Yeah, it's, America it's, and it's, China yeah, are the only countries that really matter. No, That's correct. There's no civil wars out there that have no American or Chinese influence. Like, no, every single war out there is actually just a hidden proxy war between the U.S. and China guys. How do I know this? That, that's um, correct. Because the U.S. Founded, like, funded like a coup in this place in like 1995. So, you know, um, that's why every single um, civil war or conflict out there means that everyone else but the Americans and the Chinese Chinese are basically a bunch of, you know, unintelligent monkeys who can only do what their masters tell them to. That is I what you're saying. That. China I, is I mean, that is, that is, that is basically power. what you're saying. That's basically what you're saying. Everyone but the Americans and the Chinese are calm, dumb monkeys down. who can calm only down. act okay. upon that okay. what the Americans so, are saying. Don't worry. But China has power. America has power. No one else has power. And that's just a fact. Face it. So that means that Russia doesn't have any kind of account, uh, power either then, I guess. Like, the, the yeah. Donbass war, that was actually the Chinese that were funding the DPR and LNR and not the Russians, right? Because that's what you're saying. It must have been the Chinese then. So yeah. there must have been ZTZs, you know, Russian tanks, uh, I mean, Chinese tanks running through Don Donetsk for eight years that we didn't see. Yeah, let, let's move beyond this. I, 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 I mostly agree with um, Punish on this one, but let, let's kind of get, get beyond uh, this dispute. Okay, uh, Werner von Braun, we've had many celebrities uh, join this space. Um, uh, go for it. Werner. Uh, I accidentally re uh, requested to be a speaker. Not interested in speaking, sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that was almost as anticlimactic as this past coup. Uh, <laughs> all right. Let me do this, guys. Uh, this is a good two hours, and I am going to go get a little early dinner. And uh, let's just, oh, obvious just jumped in. Okay. 
All right, obvious. You can come in and tell an anti-Irish joke, and then we'll go. But you better be funny. Okay, obvious. Go for it. You, you have to be funny. Yeah, I'm trying. I'm trying. What's the? Uh, I got a good Russian joke. Okay, go for it. So, what's 150 yards long and is lighting up for potatoes? 150 yards long and lining up for potatoes. What? A Moscow line that only eats sawdust. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, what a... What a all right, guys. What, 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 sorry. Do you have anything to say? Yeah, or you, I, I'm kind of ready to said, put a bookmark in this one. I certainly do. Yeah, what a pathetic attempt of a coup. Uh, this guy's going to... Uh, unless it was all preordained and it was a psyop or something like that, Alex Jones here stuff, this guy's going to die horribly. Uh, yeah. Hey, well, just, just, just to interject, I, just, just yeah, to interject, Prigozhin was pretty explicit in saying it's not a coup. Remember that. I mean, again, in, well, he, he said it's a march for justice, but you can, you can well, describe anything. You can call a duck. A, a swan or a robot it, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck it's a duck i mean that look you know we're just getting into semantics if, here. If, if i'm in a tank i'm traveling towards the capital of my country i have to be in the mindset that i'm going to take that country like, <laughs> yeah exactly 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 you but we're, fuck around with you're just like kind me. of reiterating stuff that i said i mean yeah, yeah it, it's um it, it was what it was but I, I agree with your sentiment that like Prigozhin should die, but I think it's it, it's kind of remarkable if he doesn't, if he is hanging out in Belarus for the rest of his days, or if he is uh, sent back to the front or something like this. I mean, in in some ways, those outcomes are almost worse in terms of delegitimizing Russia. Like you can just do anything and get away with it. Yeah, exactly. It would make Russia appear. It is far weaker. If, if those are the outcomes and there'll be another person waiting six months down the road, 12 months down the road, five years down the road, who will be taking that tank into Moscow and they will be uh, uh, exactly. taking over the country. So, yeah, but I don't have anything else. I've got no more Russian jokes. Sorry. <laughs> okay. All right, guys. Uh, this was very good, very productive, and um, good to talk to you all. I'm with some new people I, I hadn't interacted with before, so that's, that's always good. Anyway, guys, I will talk to you soon, and good luck. One second, one Cheers. second before you go. A question about your dinner. Is it yes. going to have some bugs in it? Uh, some bugs. Oh, Cla- well, being that you're Klaus Schwab, yeah, it will be total bugs. Yeah, total bugs, good. caramelized good. bugs, and a burger. Yeah, yum. Total Delicious. Swabian victory. <laughs> okay, talk to you guys later. Bye. Hot stuff. <laughs> Hot stuff. You.